We're continuing today. Um, oh, and I have to say, I'm sorry. Uh, the idea of an anniversary gift uh, to the Gospel Rescue Mission is a, another thrill of my heart. Uh, the ministry and the gospel work of the Gospel Rescue Mission of Tucson has also been one of the thrills of my life. And so uh, thank you for thinking that up and for your generosity. Uh, I'm just so excited, and uh, thank you for that. Thank you for your gifts. Okay, our worship series is God's Face, and I want us thinking about that today. Uh, this series, Opening Up God's Face, is about making room for God in your life, uh, not just in you, but around you. Uh, around you so that others can sense and just perceive the presence of God in your life, which is an amazing thought. Opening up a godly space so that God is evident by how you are living to others. And I think God's space happens when we commit to caring for others in this world, when we love one another as a witness of our faith in Jesus Christ. But the question is, what if we don't? What if many people today don't come to church or are no longer coming to church because they've been hurt by the church, by something or someone at church? There's a word for uh, uh, the defending the faith. Uh, it's apologetics. This is a word that means uh, having a system or a way to explain or defend a doctrine of beliefs. And so Christians study Christian apologetics as a way to communicate uh, with those who disagree with us. But Doug Pollock, a Christian writer, is suggesting that we may also want to study apology ethics, learning how to listen to those who have been hurt by people of faith, and learn how to express our regret, perhaps even apologize on behalf of Christ's church. And that's because many have stopped going to church today because of church. Some people have been hurt by big things. Sexual abuse, guilt, coercion, uh, perhaps a, a betrayal of confidence. Some people have been hurt by the church by what we'd call little things. Our new pastor doesn't look like our old pastor. She's the chair of that property committee that put in that new carpet. That deacon doesn't look at me right when she serves me communion. Apology ethics is an idea that says a great way we can reopen God's space around us for someone else is by checking in with them, listening to them caring for them, sympathizing with them, and perhaps offering reconciliation, seeking healing, apologizing, opening up a way for them to return to the church, the community of Christ. Now, at this point, some of you might be thinking, oh my goodness, church is hard. <laughs> People are so sensitive. Why is everyone else thin-skinned except me? Why can't everyone just be like me? Well, to that I would say, you know, families are hard, but they're worth it. And church is hard, but it's worth it. The church is the body of Christ, the family of Christ. Now, let's explore today how we can live it and keep this God space open around us for those in our community. 
who are really needing to find Jesus. If you brought your Bibles, our scripture this morning is to the far end of the New Testament. It's one of John's three letters. We're in 1 John today, uh, chapter 4, and there's wonderful guidance for our lives. Beginning at verse 7, we read, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this reading of your holy word. Help us, Spirit of Christ, to hear your voice and respond with our lives. Amen. Life is a tall order, right? Anybody here ever get overwhelmed? Anybody ever have one night where you tried to sleep and your eyes were like this? Anybody here starting a new job this fall or feel like you're facing a tall order? I mean, we have people right now in our city who are saying, oh, I've just started the U of A. Uh, I'm going to work in my new office downtown next week. Next week, I'm going to start teaching with real students in the class. Oh, yeah. I won't forget my first Sunday with all of you in 1994. Uh, It was a, a mental moment, not a breakdown, but it was a moment that happened in our South parking lot after our first worship service together, me and you and us and the Lord, after my first sermon, after the services were all over, I was walking out this lot to my car to go home, and I just stopped. It hit me. They think I can keep doing this. (laughs) I had just used my best illustrations, my favorite stories. They were all used. Uh, I I remember thinking, what am I going to do next Sunday? That's only six days away. 
And do they really think I can be the leader they think I am with the meetings I've got scheduled and appointments I've got booked, all that's happening this next week? And with those meetings coming up, how would I write next week's sermon? Oh, they think I can do this. And to confess to you, um, I still have moments 25 years later when I marvel at this crazy job of mine. Shepherding the flock of God. Proclaiming the word of God. Ministering in the art of soul care through the Spirit of God. And now, to be here 25 years later, still at it? I I'm going to make you a promise today. <clears throat> I'm going to keep at this until I get it right. <laughs> and, and you know, like a medical doctor, I love that word. There's a reason they call it practice. This last 25 years for me has been a practice, just a warm-up. Uh, and uh, as I think about memories, what we've shared together, those who have been promoted to glory, uh, it's because of the practice of God's Holy Spirit and a testament of His grace that we learn, live and serve the gospel together. Amen? Amen? And so we need to continually be practicing our ABCs. Today's letter that's called 1 John is written to guide us in the basics, the ABCs, of what we do when we are facing a tall order in life, of living as God's people in front of others. And God's answer, God's guidance for us in facing tall orders can be summarized to one word, love. This letter in the Bible called 1 John, I don't know if you know this, it's frequently the New Testament scripture that is used for first year seminary students who are learning Greek. And that's because the words and the grammar of 1 John are fairly simple. Uh, even our reading today from chapter 4 reads like a McGuffey primary reader uh, for a kindergartner. God is love. Love one another. You know, it's, it's kind of like, see, dick, run. Run, dick, run. Now we can wonder, why is John, this eloquent writer of the gospel of Jesus that bears his name, why is he suddenly writing in such simple terms? Well, here's my thought. It's because God's love is simple. I believe God looks upon us and calls us to respond to him as a parent relates to a little child. Jesus, you know, never once said, oh, grow up. Jesus never once said, will you act like an adult with your faith? No, he said, if you want to come to me and come into the kingdom, come like a child. And I've come to believe at this point in my life that living starts out simple. But then as you grow up, it becomes very complicated. But then in our later, older years, it starts becoming clarifying and simple again. And I think this is what was happening for this writer of this letter before us today. And our problem, friends, is that for most of us right now, life is still complicated. We have passwords to remember. We have alarm codes. We have news reports that we just feel like we have to turn off. We have storms hitting our country that are devastating. We have human emotions that make us feel like we're facing tall orders. But here's the good news. God never tires of caring for us like little children. Martin Luther used to say that when God addresses us, he does so with baby talk. God accommodates us to our limitations. How did God get Moses' attention? He used a burning bush. Kids are fascinated by fire. 
And then how would God communicate his ten commands from the mountain? God would use kindergarten clarity. The literal Hebrew of the Ten Commandments is, you no kill, you no lie, you no steal. And so the Old Testament prophets, they would tell animal stories about lions and lambs. Jesus would tell stories about seeds and figs. And God's ultimate baby talk was given to us when he gave us the gift of his presence as a baby born to Mary in a manger in Bethlehem. But here's our situation. Human love becomes complicated. As we grow through life, we tend to stress performance over presence. You know, I, I just heard this past week about an online dating site. I heard it from a friend. I wasn't checking it myself. An online dating site where it states that your best love match is dependent on 29 human aspects of compatibility. It's called a compatibility matching system. And all these 29 traits of values and humor and hobbies and intellect. And, and my thought was, just 29? I mean, you and I could add another 29 quickly, right? The, the trait of toilet seat lowering. The, the trait of toothpaste tube squeezing. The, the trait of backseat driving, for example. You know, Michelle and I, we just came back uh, this last week from a visit to California. And, I, and it's really cool. Michelle drove the whole way. I just held the steering wheel. Now, <laughs> I got permission to use that joke, <laughs> just like I have for all 25 years. But let's be clear. <laughs> how we perform with our loved ones, how we measure up with our choices and actions, it absolutely matters. It's just that our human performance doesn't matter absolutely. God's love and presence was never given to us to excuse us from responsibility. But it's just that our ability to perform perfectly can never be the standard upon which love is based. God shows us that he is love and that because he is love, he loves us with a presence that supersedes human performance. With God, it's like this. God's love becomes simple. With God, it's his presence that is stressed over performance. You might remember that Old Testament story about the prophet Hosea whose wife was a prostitute. Her name was Gomer, which probably didn't do much for her self-esteem. But she sold herself for others' pleasure. And her husband, Hosea, became outraged, heartbroken. He thought they had matched up on all 29 categories. Hosea knew that the only logical thing for him to do was to throw her out, dismiss her, divorce her. But he found to his amazement that he couldn't bring himself to do it. There was this bond, this covenant. It was then that Hosea the prophet realized, I think I know now how God feels. Now, friends, you and I are nothing to write home about. <laughs> There's not a day that goes by where we really hit the bullseye of perfection square on the nose. Can, can you think of one day, just one day, in which you were completely faithful and righteous in your calling as a God follower in word, actions, and thoughts? The Apostle Paul tells us, there is none righteous, 
No, not one. Isaiah the prophet once said, Our righteousness is as filthy rags. How am I standing here, 25 years later in this pulpit, by the amazing grace of God? How are you here in this sanctuary in acting in the participation of holy worship with a living God by the grace of God? With God and this love that's described again and again in our reading, the word love and it's agape, no strings attached, grace love, it's mentioned 27 times in our reading. Our confidence, our basis for living, our standing before God then and now is based on God's presence, not our performance. And so what is our call? Our call is to present it forward. And so if God's love is so simply based on his presence, his spirit graciously bestowed to us through the life, the sacrificial death of Jesus, his son, Jesus' resurrection from death, Jesus, my friends, wants us to live it forward. John says, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Notice how he said that. Notice. He's not saying, when people say thank you back, love one another. It's not when people appreciate you, love one another. It's not when people treat you in the same reciprocal way, love one another. It's not when someone is especially attractive to you, love one another. It's not when someone can help you get ahead, love one another. No. Since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. The Apostle Paul points out in Romans chapter 5, he says, God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. People aren't perfect. Love them anyway. You and I are not perfect. Jesus loves us anyway. Jesus loves you anyway. There's something in me right now that wants to say that 25 more times. Because it's so astounding. Jesus, the Son of the living God, loves you anyway. Sometimes I think our masterpiece achievements in life, like perhaps an anniversary like this for me, are to God like a child's coloring picture, <laughs> crudely drawn and colored of a heart and some people and family. But God puts it on his fridge. God tapes it up to his cupboard. Oh, friends, you and I will never, never know how much God loves us. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. For you. God gave us his son because of a love that was so pure, that big, that expensive. His dying for us and rising from death would be the definitive sacrifice that would clear us, clear our name, make us right in God's eyes, restore us. And so, you know, in this world, performance matters. It absolutely does. How we perform at work, how we perform as wives, husbands, children, students, musicians, employees. But oh Christ ones, don't ever forget that we love because God first loved us. In this world, performance matters, but God's presence matters more. God's grace matters more. During the rigorous interviews with this church's search committee 25 years ago, interviews with me about possibly becoming hired here as a pastor, 
I, I had this moment where I just felt, you know, um, this might be too tall of an order. <laughs> uh, how could I live up to everyone's expectations? <laughs> and what about my family? How could they move to this desert land and live up to a picture of a courier in Ives family by a hearth, perfect children? So I asked at the end of all the interviews, I asked at the very end what for me was a defining question of coming to serve here as your pastor. I think I said to the search committee, I will do my best to love this church and to love the people of this church and this community. But will you love me? Will you love my wife? Will you love my children? And today what I'm celebrating with all of you is that through it all, through the ups and the downs of our life together, through the celebrations of God's hand moving among us, through the wrenching moments of heartbreaking tragedy, over all this time, we love because God loves us. And for the years to come, will you? Let's pray. Oh, gracious God of astounding love, we love you, Lord. We praise your holy name for giving us yourself as the best gift. Oh, Jesus, help me to be better at loving. Help each of us here to be an ambassador, a better agent of love for all those around us through all the days of the week. Jesus, show us how to reach out with our hearts, not just slogans. Jesus, help us to excitedly look forward to the years ahead and not live in fear. Jesus, help us to claim your love, which like a shield will lead the way forward so that this world will know there is hope, Jesus, in you. Oh, Lord Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen.